Hi, hello, PhD listeners. It's summertime, and you know what that means. For us, it means travel, for work, for fun, catching up on projects, and even the desire to relax and take a break. But because of that, there is not going to be a new episode this week, but we thought a timely topic for the season would be how best to manage and take control of your time so you can accomplish the things you want to get done while making time for your own self-care. This week, We're going to bring you an episode that originally aired on October 19th, 2016, where we discuss a time management trick called the focus funnel. We hope your summer's going well and hope you enjoy this episode. This episode of Hello PhD is sponsored by Promega and listeners like you. Thanks for your support. Sometimes it can be really hard to say no when someone asks you to do something. No. See how easy it is? (laughs) Welcome to Hello PhD, a podcast for scientists and the people who love them. Today on the show, we share tips for multiplying your time without bending the laws of physics. Stay with us. And we're back. This is Hello PhD, episode 59. I'm Joshua Hall. Wrong. You're wrong. <laughs> and I'm Daniel Arneman. And we'll discuss the human side of science and life in the lab. Hey, Josh. I watched a <laughs> lot of debates this week. Sorry. <laughs> oh, jeez. That was uncomfortable. I couldn't imagine doing that for more than, like, 10 seconds. Yeah, I was looming over you the entire time, too. It was good. <laughs> so much for the apolitical nature of our podcast. I didn't say anything political. That's true. Hey, Dan, did you survive the hurricane? It was quite uh, fine where I was. How about you? Yeah, I don't know. It was. I would say it was a little worse than, than expected. My pond view from my backyard became a little too close for comfort. Oceanfront property in central North Carolina? Yeah, I could have launched a canoe off my back deck. Oh, that could be a feature. Yeah, not quite as, as, as cool, <laughs> not quite as, cool as it sounds. Uh, but we, actually, we were pretty lucky. Half my neighborhood lost power, but we only lost internet. Yeah, hopefully everybody listening is safe and sound and dry. Absolutely. Um, It did amuse me, Dan, because uh, my neighborhood has a Facebook group and uh, other friends in the area who who are impacted with power outages and internet outages were complaining online on social media about being without power or internet. How is it? Oh, with phones. Yeah. Yeah. I thought, wow, we really... We've really come a long way where we can now complain online about our inability to get online. The good news is it didn't immediately resort to cannibalism and anarchy, so I guess that's good. No, we can survive it at least 48 hours. Five minutes without internet. You managed to rescue a beer from the back of the fridge. That's exciting. I did. This one was floating through the backyard, and I I scooped it up. Today we're drinking from Mystery Brewing in Hillsboro, North Carolina. Have you heard of Hillsboro, Dan? My new hometown. Your new hometown. This is the Horny Gold English Style India Pale Ale. Okay. I understand English Style India Pale and Ale. Uh, Horny Gold? What is that supposed to mean? So I looked this up. So one thing about Mystery Brewing that's pretty cool, the brewmaster is Eric Lars Myers, who I've had the luck of, of meeting and hearing him speak. He's the author of really the authoritative text on North Carolina breweries. He's the author of North Carolina Beer and Breweries, which is probably vastly out of date now. I think it came out in 2012. Uh, But the other thing that's cool about him, his wife, I believe, is an English PhD. And so many of his beers have names that draw inspiration from literature or other English history. It seems exciting. And this one is no different. So Horny Gold is named after Benjamin Horny Gold, who was a pirate. Oh, very cool. It's good that his wife is not a biology PhD, or this would be like the Gila cell beer. Or maybe maybe, like maybe the, the horny toad. Yeah, this could be the fetal calf serum. So uh, <laughs> I taste the fetal calf. <laughs> yeah, it's delicious. Uh, Fresh squeezed. One one bit of trivia about Benjamin Hornigold, the pirate, his second command was a gentleman named Edward Teach. Have you heard of him? Uh, is there a reason I should have? Well, Edward Teach is better known in some circles as Blackbeard. Oh, I would not get that from his, his name. I know. So, Horny Gold, the predecessor of Blackbeard. Well, we got some feedback, actually. Yeah, we got uh, an email from uh, a listener that had written us a, a while back. I think it was episode 42 we covered. Um, if you remember the, the episode where we gave advice to Jon Snow. 
Yeah, we did a whole episode on his question. Yeah, so John was a fifth-year student. Uh, he was basically stuck in a rut. So he had finished a paper, but he had put all of his work basically into this one paper because that was how he got it across the finish line. Um, and he spent six months after that. Every experiment you know, just kind of led to a dead end. And basically, his advisor was losing interest and wasn't paying attention anymore. And, and he said, now what? Um, you're fifth year and you've got no no plans for the future. So we gave him some advice. You can go back to episode 42 and, and hear what we said. But um, he wrote to us this week and he said, I've been meaning to respond. I've, it's been a long summer, but I've had a discussion with my PI and we've got a pathway towards graduation planned and agreed upon! Exclamation point. That is fantastic news. He says, thanks for the advice in the episode. It was really helpful. So um, I believe the advice centered around you're done find a way to be done. And, and it sounds like that's what he's been able to do. Sounds like he's, he's gotten a yeah. path forward now. Yep, it does. So go back and listen to that one. Um, if you're in that same situation. Yeah. And that's actually a good segue into, or a good reminder for me to mention, we love hearing from you guys out there. So if you're in grad school now, or you're a postdoc, you're in the thick of your training, we want to hear what you're up to. What are you going through? We'd love to talk about it on the show. Whatever it is you're going through, chances are several other people are probably dealing with the same thing. All right. Dan, you ready for Science in the News? I'm so ready. Dan, you like to drink beer? I like beer, yeah. What if you could drink without any risk of hangover or liver damage? Um, I don't typically risk hangover. Uh, liver damage, I can't see my liver, so I have no idea. Well, what I wanted to talk about today is something that actually has been at least conceived of for a few years now, but for some reason was making the news circuit again, and that is the discovery and production of synthetic alcohol. What do we need synthetic alcohol for? So it starts with a professor, Dr. David Nutt, who's a neuropsychopharmacologist at Imperial College in the UK, and Dr. Nutt served on... Actually, he worked for the British government. He served on the Committee of Safety of Medicines and was chairman of the Advisory Council on the Misuse of Drugs. Um, but what, what he has done and his interest is in making legal and illegal drugs safer and with less side effects. I guess sort of the point of view, you know, people obviously are going to use these substances. Is there a way we can, if people aren't going to stop doing these things, is there a way we can make versions of these substances that are actually safer and have less health impacts? I have to say it's a unique approach. Usually it focuses on how do we change the behavior or how do we inject some synthetic chemical that blocks the reward pathways. But he's saying, hey, let's find a safer way to drink. Well, the interesting or thing... Or do drugs. Well, <laughs> that is what he's trying to do. And uh, the interesting thing about... Timothy Leary for our day. <laughs> the interesting thing about Dr. Nutt is he actually was fired from his governmental position in 2009 because I guess a pamphlet was made available that highlighted some of his research talks he gave. And what he was advocating for was that drugs be more classified by their actual scientifically proven harms and side effects rather than sort of historical precedents. And so he talked a lot about how substances like alcohol and tobacco, which are widely used, in a lot of ways are more harmful than drugs that were illegal like marijuana and ecstasy. So I'm reading your notes here, and he claimed that horse riding is more dangerous than ecstasy. That seems like a, a very possible and provable hypothesis, right? I would there say... There are numbers on both of those things. If you had an equal number of people ride a horse and do ecstasy, which uh, population would risk more injury? Yeah, I know for me, it would probably be the horse riding, because I'm not very skilled at that. I, I appreciate... Not that I'm skilled at... <laughs> yeah, at ecstasy. Rolling on ecstasy I, either. I appreciate his rationalism, and I can understand that the government would not enjoy his work very much. Yeah, so apparently this whole thing that occurred in the UK in 2009 actually thrust um, Professor Nutt into a little more fame. And so one of the things he's... One of his big projects now is this Alcosynth. And so what Alcosynth does, at least the promise of it, is that it mimics the effects of alcohol in the brain without the negative health effects, without the, the hangover, without the possibilities for, for liver damage. Um, and one approach Dr. Nutt has in trying to sell this is not just, hey, let's get drunk without the risk of hangover, but that there's actually a lot of economic costs to side effects of drinking, like loss of productivity from hangovers, absenteeism, absenteeism poor performance, et cetera. So, so one of the things he says is that one reason Alcosynth may be safer to drink than, than traditional alcohol is has to do with the byproducts when alcohol is broken down. So 
when our body breaks down alcohol normally, there's a compound that's produced called acetaldehyde. And this is actually um, a toxin that can build up if we consume too much alcohol, can make us feel bad the next day. But if it gets to high enough levels, our liver can't process it and we can, we can get lots of nasty side effects, possible tissue damage. And just to break down product, basically, alcohol dehydrogenase. So one of, apparently one of the compounds, and he's testing, I think, something like nine different compounds right now. And um, the reason there hasn't been a lot of detail about it, I guess he's in the process of getting the intellectual property secured, uh, the patent secured before he goes public with, with trying to get these produced. But I guess two specific compounds they're really working to make available to the public. But I guess these work by actually uh, mimicking the neurotransmitter GABA, which is really has a lot of effects in the brain. Um, but one of the things that helps you have these um, euphoric effects that, that alcohol can give you, as well as other drugs. So where do I invest in this company? <laughs> Oh, I said nine. So actually, he's reportedly patented close to 90 different Alcosynth Alcosynth compounds, and two are undergoing testing for widespread use. But here's my thing, Dan. Here's my problem with this. Maybe I'm not the target audience for this, because I don't know about you, but I don't necessarily drink for the purposes of getting drunk. You know, when I think about, you know, alcohol, when I think about wine or bourbon, you know, it's about enjoying the, it's about the process that it was made and enjoying trying to pick out the nuances of the flavors. And I think you haven't been to college recently, Josh. <laughs> I bet you there's a, you know, there's a very big market for people who would like to go out and party on Saturday night and uh, still make it to work on Monday. Caution, old man alert. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know. I don't think I'm the target audience. I'm a little... I'm a little skeptical at these synthetic compounds that at low doses can impact these neurotransmitters that are pretty pretty broad in their function. But who knows? Maybe I, on to the other hand, on. am going to invest in whatever company this is. This uh, guy's going to make a lot of money. Well, if you guys want to learn more about Dr. Nutt and some of his ideas on drugs, both legal and illegal, and the potential to um, improve our drug situation by actually changing the drugs themselves. You should check out his book. He wrote a book just a couple of years ago, Drugs Without the Hot Air, Minimizing the Harms of Legal and Illegal Drugs. Uh, we'll put a link to that on the show notes. All right. So speaking of loss of productivity, um, until Alcosynth comes along, we're going to talk about some other ways you could probably improve your productivity. So Dan, this last couple of weeks, I've actually been working on a new time management workshop. Did your Pomodoro clock die? Yeah, you may remember in episode 15, we talked about some time management strategies, including the, including the Pomodoro technique, which I will discuss again um, in a few minutes. I think we can also, uh, we can still implement that. But, but there, there's a new concept that I learned about in researching for this new time management um, workshop that I was working on, and it's called the Focus Funnel. You can drink beer through a funnel if you're in college. <laughs> <Is> that, <laughs> you just keep Alcacin through a funnel. Alcacin through a funnel. But what I assume I wanted, that's not what you're talking that's about. That's not what I'm talking about. So before I get into this focus funnel, Dan, how much do you know about the history of time management theory? Oh, I don't know. This has got to go back to the 19... Blah, 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 with Henry Ford somehow? You're, yeah, you're pretty close, Dan. So really, people started thinking about improving time management really in the 40s and 50s. Um, when we were starting to ramp up industrially and with technology. Um, so in the 40s and 50s, there's what we'll call one-dimensional time management. And so really the push back in those days was to increase efficiency, right? So it was all about, all right, if we improve technology and we improve our processes well enough, we can just get a lot more done in the same amount of time. Yeah, cut out the waste, and now you're only doing the valuable stuff, and it's much more efficient. Absolutely. But then when we moved into the late 80s and 90s, um, a guy came along, Stephen Covey, and wrote a book. Oh, yes, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. But yes, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. How many of those habits are, are your habits, Josh? I don't remember any of them. I can't exactly. remember that book. But, but so what, what his idea and, and what other uh, of his contemporaries were saying at that point in time was, okay, you know, technology has come a long way, but really there's only so much we can increase our efficiency. There's a limit to how much we can get done. We can't get everything done in one, at one time. Give me, give me science lab examples of the 1D and the 2D. Yeah, I think the 1D might be 
So let's say you're doing PCR, Dan. So let's uh, say you're going to be doing PCR pretty regularly, maybe every day, every other day. So the 1D improvement might be instead of mixing each tube individually with tack and buffer, and maybe I make a, a master mix with all the, the important stuff, and then I just put my sample, you know, I aliquot it out, then I put my sample in each one, and I just saved a bunch of time. Absolutely. So the master mix, that'd be a great a great improvement in the efficiency 1D. of setting up a PCR reaction, right? Yeah, so the 2D says, all right, there's only so much we can do in a day. So what we need to do is not just try to make every task on our list more efficient, but actually look at all of our tasks on our list and and judge them, compare them to one another based on their urgency versus their importance, right? So not all of these tasks are created equal with how important they are to me and my goals when I'm trying to get done. And also in the second dimension, there might be different levels of urgency. So maybe one PCR, my PI really needs it for um, a grant that he or she's writing or I have lab meeting tomorrow. So I might prioritize the PCR that is important to that and maybe put off the exploratory experiment that, you know, that isn't important until down the road. Yeah, I'm going to do both of them with an efficient process in the one-dimensional way, but I've got to pick and choose how I'm going to do it. That's right. So that held for about 20 years, but, you know, in the last five years, five to 10 years or so, a technology has really fundamentally changed the way we work these days with computers on not just our phones, but now on our watch. You know, with technology, our work is always with us now. And so we've really moved the sort of the buzzwords now in the time management fields are you've heard of the term work-life balance. I have. You know, and what work-life balance kind of says is, all right, I've got my work over here, and then on the other hand, I've got my life, and so I'm either doing one... assuming that your phone does not come home with you. Right. That's like, oh, I'm doing one or the other, and I have to balance, make sure I'm not living in work world too much or not in home world too much, and I'm kind of balancing the two. But what we have now, Dan, with technology kind of bringing our work with us all the time is a shift from work-life balance to work-life integration. So the work's always with us, so how can we integrate work and life together in a meaningful way that's also productive. And so this is where we start to get ideas in people who think about efficiency and productivity, where they add this third dimension. So we have the importance and the urgency, but this third dimension of significance, right? So now we're judging all the tasks we do with this sort of third layer that is, well, how long will this matter? Is it urgent? Is it important? But then Comparatively, what kind of long-term impact is it for doing this thing versus that thing? I feel like people in the sciences, when you're working in lab, you have lived in the reality of taking your work home with you for much longer than maybe the rest of the world. So even before you had a smartphone, you were in lab taking time points at 3 a.m. And it's just how it is. And so I'm interested to see how we're going to apply this notion of significance in that realm. Yeah, no, I agree, Dan. And so, so what I want to do is one of the things that, that we have to think about is once we identify, all right, I've got my list of things to do, and maybe I rank them based on not just their urgency, not just their importance, but how significant are these to me, to getting my goals done? How do we more efficiently complete these things? How do we um, really fit all this stuff in? We you know, we can always have our work with us. How do we integrate our work into our life in a way that we're not just working all the time? And so a lot of this comes from a guy named Rory Vaden. He is the author of a book called Procrastinate on Purpose. I just subscribed to his newsletter. This sounds great. <laughs> Finally, permission to procrastinate. Um, and actually, we are going to give you permission to procrastinate. Today. I'll be right back. <laughs> uh, we should release this episode like on Wednesday or something. Perfect. And so what, what Rory Vaden focuses on is these people that he calls time multipliers, um, which is just a fancy way for saying highly productive people. And and what his thesis is, is that these time multiplying people actually spend more of their time doing things that actually create more time. And then what they do is they give themselves permission to focus on the things that have the most significance to them, kind of at the expense of things that have less significance. And so he lays out this framework called the focus funnel um, that I thought we could go through. Let's do it. And and as far as we can, let's apply it to things that I might be doing in lab. Yeah, that sounds great. And also, there's a really cute cartoon diagram of the focus funnel that we will put on the show notes. So you can stop the podcast now, go print this out, and you can look at it. You can hold it in your hands while we're describing the, the focus funnel to you. Get a tattoo of it. Take it with you. I mean, I already have one. 
But I actually I can't see it from where... Take us through the funnel, Josh. All right. So if you imagine, Dan, we have this funnel. And this funnel is a funnel for our tasks. So you could imagine you've got your to-do list, all those tasks that are on there. We're going to dump these into the funnel. Okay. Okay. So my, my, let me make this list. My funnel list is I've got to prepare some media to grow my cells. I've got to grow those cells. I've got to pour a gel. I've got to prep my PCR. I've got to get it loaded in the gel. Maybe work on some writing. I got to do some writing for sure. I'm better eat lunch at some point today. I've got a meeting with my PI. You've got to go get groceries. I got to make some slides. Okay. Yeah. So we've got a lot of stuff going in the funnel. We got a lot of things going in the funnel. Okay. So we're going to dump these tasks in the funnel. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to ask ourselves, is there anything on our list or are there any of these tasks that we can eliminate? Okay. So if I decide, you know, I've got enough figures in this paper and I don't actually need to do this PCR, take it off. Yeah. Or, you know, maybe, well, I've really done this PCR three times already and I've seen the same result. You know, maybe I need to tweak something else. I could pee hack it. I could pee hack it. (laughs) So, yeah. So, the first step really, and I think this is true for for a lot of things, you know, one of the great ways we can create more time is to basically just have fewer tasks on our list. And, And one kind of tool, I guess, or consideration you can think about with this elimination step is, especially as you advance in your career, being more comfortable with saying no to things. Um, I heard this really interesting way of thinking about that. And that was sometimes it can be really hard to say no when someone asks you to do something. No. See how easy it is? <laughs> uh, you know, you want to feel bad. It feels nice when somebody says, hey, Dan, could you help me with this PCR? Hey, Dan, could you help me Yeah, and then I show like, me yeah, for the I'll third time? It, You're yep. like, yeah, I'll do it. Um, but the thing you have to But I'll be is, really mad the whole time. Well, probably. You'll hold it against me. But the thing you consider, and this really changed my thinking a little bit, and that is when you say no to something, you're saying no to one thing, right? You're saying no to that thing you were asked to do. But when you say yes to something, effectively, you're also saying no to an infinite number of other things that you could have been doing with that time. I mean, you're getting a little metaphysical. Are you drinking Algosynth over there? (laughs) Um, So that, you know, that really changed how I thought about a lot of things. You know, you need to be careful what you say yes to. Yeah. The phrase I've heard is it's either a no or a hell yes. Yeah. There should be nothing in between like, oh, I guess I will. Yeah. Because once it's on your to-do list, right? then you got to deal with it. So that keeping things from getting on your to-do list in the first place can actually be an important skill to learn. And I will say one thing, that as you advance in your career, there are more opportunities for that. If you're an undergrad listening in the lab and we're talking about lab stuff, I mean, really, there are very few opportunities for you. Yeah, I was like, could you wash this glass frame? No. Nope. You're, you're done. There are infinite other things I would rather be doing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you're fired. That's right. Um, so anyway, the first thing is think, is there anything here that I can eliminate from my list? You should definitely be asking yourself that. And then the next step, though, as we go down the funnel, is all the tasks that are left after the elimination step. Ask yourself, well, can I automate any of these tasks? And this is where we start to think about you know, what I said earlier. Are there ways I can spend a little bit of time now that might save me time in the future. And let me give you an example, Dan. It's not lab-related, but hopefully we'll get we'll we'll send the concept home a little bit. And that is online bill pay. Are you an online bill pay person? I am. You know, that's something that I have put off doing. This was a great example for me because you know, for me to set up online bill pay for for everything, I figure it might take me half an hour to do that. And, you know, when it comes down to it, if I'm paying bills and I think like, oh, I should set up automated bill pay, but I don't have 30 minutes to do that. I can just manually pay them in five minutes. But the way a time multiplier would think was, all right, well, yeah, it'll take me 30 minutes to set up this online bill pay. And that will save me five minutes a month. So six months from now, I've broken even on my investment of time. And so moving forward from there, I'm actually making more time. My investment's paying off because spending that 30 minutes initially, now I'm saving this five minutes every month moving forward. Money in the bank. Yeah, there are a lot of daily life tasks that um, get easier when they get automated. I mean, you can subscribe to things that get shipped to your house. Um, And Josh, you know that I'm a big advocate for scientists learning at least a little bit of code. So all of that data analysis that you are, we have a phrase at work called meat bagging, like you are a human meat bag because the computer's not doing it, you're doing it. And anything that you can automate with one simple script 
um, that you never have to go through and like copy and paste those cells into Excel and then do the math. I mean, you're going to save so much time. Yeah, I was. I thought you would like this thing because I know you're an efficiency guy. I was actually in a room with several um, computational biology faculty members not too long ago, and one of them made a comment that stuck with me, and that was, if there's a task you need to do on the computer more than three times, you should write a script for it. And, you know, I think this is a great example. You know, even if, you know, like me, when I was a grad student, you weren't uh, super computer code savvy. You know, I can think of ways looking back could have saved me a lot of time using our PCR example again. You're setting up these reactions. You've got to calculate, all right, if I need this volume um, with this enzyme, this is how much buffer I need, this is how much water I need to add. You know, I could have devoted 10 or 15 minutes to write, even to make up a simple Excel spreadsheet. You'll be pleased to know that I did that when I was in grad school. Tell it how many samples you have, what volume you want to do. Yeah, I mean. It all comes out and the back if, end. if you think about, you know, how many times I probably did PCR as a grad student. Thousands. Yeah, if I would have set that up, it would have probably taken me 15 minutes, maybe 30 minutes. I was and, great at the automation, not so great at the science, <laughs> turned out. Well, and how much time do you think that saved you? Oh. Over the course of your grad school career. I mean, I had other problems. <laughs> I had five and a half years of other things to worry about. Yeah. So so that's what we're talking about. So so what I want you to do is you can look at your, your to-do list and anything you didn't eliminate, ask yourself next, well, can I automate any of these things? Can I spend a little bit of time today that might save me even more time moving forward? And so once you've asked those questions, then the last thing you can ask is, are there any of these tasks that I can actually delegate to someone else? So I'm saying... Can't somebody else do it? <laughs> um, you know, and at this point, too, these are all tasks that you're saying, all right, these are actually important and significant for me to do, but is there a way these can get done without me having to do them? And I will also give the caveat again, this is one of those things that maybe if you're an undergrad who just started in the lab or a rotation student... You are the one that will be delegated to? Yeah, your opportunities yeah. to cash this in will be slim. But one, one thing I do want to point out, and this is a real-life example that I know I've dealt with in the past, and maybe some of our listeners are too, is if you're a senior grad student or, or a postdoc, one common thing you might do in the lab is mentor a, a younger student, a newer student. So maybe you're mentoring an undergrad or, or a rotation student. Why not? They want the experience, most likely, um, especially an undergrad who's new to the lab. Why not teach them to do some things that maybe they would be eager to do um, and might actually save you a lot of time? Now, I know what you're probably thinking or saying, which is, well, it'll take me quite a bit of time to teach them, and they probably, it would be quicker for me to just do it myself. Um, that would that would be my first thought, yeah, depending on who the, the delegee was. Is that a word? Yeah, you know, it'd probably be quicker for me to just do it myself, and they're probably not going to do as good a job as I would do. Clearly not. I do a great job. But, you know, here's the thing. The reality is, well, they won't do as good a job as you the first time or maybe even the second time. But again, what we're doing is we're trying to make an investment of our time that will eventually pay off into saving more time. And you made the money connection, Dan, but it's just like money. You know, you put money in an investment account and it doesn't double in value in a week, right? But over time, and, and the same thing is true here. Um, and the reality you often find is sometimes when you let go of things, often it's control that's causing you to hold on to tasks and have this thought, well, well no one could do this experiment as well as I could or this, this task. But often what you'll find is if you are really swamped with lots of other things and you're just holding on, like, oh, I've got to get this done myself, chances are the eager undergrad who really is excited to do this might end up doing a better job than you would have and might innovate um, the thing you let go of in ways that you wouldn't have because you were totally strung out when you were trying to do it. Yeah, but maybe not on the first try. And I think I think what you're talking about is, yes, in the short term, this is going to be a little bit um, maybe a little painful, a little bit more work, but then in the long term. So so the, some of the examples we gave, I feel like Jim is going to load the autoclave with his own stuff later. I'll just, you know, drop my flasks off with him, hand that off so I don't have it on my mental overhead. Mm -hmm. um, certainly somebody else can load this gel. An undergrad would love to load a gel. And, there's, you know, as long as you don't splash it everywhere, you're not going to get yeah. into too much trouble. Um, splitting cells. There's something that takes a lot of time that an undergrad would be great at. They might contaminate one or two the first few times, but um, it's a technique that's learnable and everybody should learn. Yeah, absolutely. And so then, Dan, you know, once we've 
eliminated things, we've automated things, we've delegated things, we'll finally be left with, all right, well, these are things I need to do, all right? And so at this point, this is where, all right, it's time to get We're some stuff done. at the bottom of done. the funnel. Yeah, and these are the things that I'm going to do, right? And so, so here what's important is you'll have hopefully your trimmed down list of things, and that's where you have to ask yourself the question, of these things, which are the most significant to me and my, and my goals right now. And what you do is you decide, well, this one's the most significant. And this is what's important, Dan. You give yourself permission to focus on seeing that item through to completion and permission to procrastinate all of the other things. You put them back up in the funnel and don't think about them again until you complete the task at hand. And this is where it goes back to episode 15, where we talked about the Pomodoro technique. This is something I have totally implemented in my life, and that is the importance of focus. So when you're, you've identified the task you're working on, turn off the notifications on your phone, eliminate the distractions. If you're doing something on the computer, you're writing, go to the library if you need to. Uh, but really, don't do anything else until you see that through uh, either to completion or to the amount of time that you've devoted to it. So if 15 tasks go in the top of the funnel, you might end up doing five of them or three of them or two of them, but you did them in much less time because you actually avoided all the distractions. Absolutely. And I want to say, I guess this is a little bit of a revelation I had with this focus thing. And I was thinking back on myself, Dan, you or I, we came through college, what, in the late 90s, early 2000s. I remember I started college as an undergrad in 1998. And I believe we were the first class of freshmen that were required to have a computer coming in. So one thing we didn't have, though, we didn't have smartphones. uh, We didn't have computers with us all the time. So one thing I remember that I was really good at as an undergraduate was studying. So if I had an exam, it was very easy for me to go to a study room or the library and sit with my book and my notes for hours. There was no the Facebook? No, there was none of that. I didn't have a laptop. There wasn't a laptop. or I mean, I guess they existed, but I didn't have one. And they probably, at that point, weighed just slightly less than a desktop yeah, computer. A couple of bricks. Uh, but I realized that was something that was a normal part of my life, was I could sit down and focus for three or four hours on a task. Nowadays, I, I really look at myself... You just said nowadays, which is also dating you, but go ahead. <laughs> but I realize now... I have a really hard time sitting and focusing on something for more than you know 20 or 30 minutes because I'm looking at my email notifications or checking social media tweet, or tweet tweet yeah yeah and and you know there's actually research on this that I've gotten interested in we we mentioned a study um, in a previous episode that I'm not going to get into now but what can happen is a lot of times all these inputs of information can rewire our brains and actually decrease our ability to focus and actually is really detrimental in our ability to get stuff done. So what occurred to me when I contrasted my today self with my undergraduate self was, oh my gosh, I feel like <laughs> I've rewired my brain and I, can do th- I can't do things now that I could do then. Um, so I've really made an effort to try to implement this focus thing as a way of kind of increasing my productivity and getting my brain back to a place that can focus. And it really has paid off. So my advice would be to you out there is if you have trouble focusing, try turning the notifications off, try putting the phone away even if you just do it for 25, 30 minutes at a time, and you'll be amazed at what you can get done. Set that tomato timer. Now, what happens to the things that we procrastinate? They just float off into the distance? No, so those are back in the funnel. So once you've spent the time you've allotted for the task at hand, now it's time to move to the next task on the list. So what you might find is for certain tasks, if you filtered them back through the funnel for days or weeks, you might realize, oh, you know what? I really can't eliminate that task. I thought it was important, but actually it's not. Um, I'm really just prioritizing them. And, you know, this can be a fast process. So, you know, maybe some of your tasks might take you 30 minutes to do, and then you move on to the next one. Um, But you're continually putting these back through the funnel and evaluating all of them to make sure they really are the best way to use your time. Once you decide a a task is the right thing to do now, focus on it until you get it done. So it's eliminate, automate, delegate, concentrate, procrastinate. We'll put the image (laughs) up on the web so that you can take a look at it, get kind of mental model of it. And then uh, write to us, send us emails, tweet to us. What are the tasks today that you're doing 
that you decided you can actually eliminate? Uh, what are the things that you think you could probably automate if you gave it a few minutes? What are the things that you are planning to delegate? It'd be really fun to share some feedback. Analyzing your task through this lens, what are the what are the things that jump out? What are the things that you would change? Yeah, I think it would be totally useful if people had some real life suggestions in the lab for ways they've automated common things or ways they've found to, to delegate them. That'd be really useful. All right, Dan. Let's go into this etymology puzzle. Okay, the clue last week was specially designed for you, Josh. The clue was this fast walking ungulate looks like a cross between a camel and a leopard. Did you have any guesses for me? And don't read the answer. All right, so this is interesting. I went to my favorite journal, Wikipedia. Odd, oh, those odd, odd combination. Apparently, there are odd toed ungulates and even toed ungulates. Horses and rhinos are odd toed. Cattle, pigs, giraffes, camels, deer, and hippos are even toed. Okay, so do you have a guess for me? Fast walking. Looks like a cross between a camel and a leopard. Oh, okay. And I'll give you another hint. All right, I'm going to talk about go about giraffe. Oh, okay, giraffe. there it is. It, it took, <laughs> took a little prompting. The answer was giraffe. Uh, comes from an Arabic word. I get excited when I get to do languages that are not Greek and Latin. Um, Zarafa, which is translated as fast walker. Now, if you go back to the uh, story you did, the, your science in the news about giraffes being, what, four species now? Yeah, four. We, we talked about how they live in the same place, but they can kind of get around pretty quickly. I thought it was predicting the fact that giraffes actually mean uh, fast walker. So the last part, the species name, which was now the northern giraffe, now there are three other species, but the northern giraffe, the species name is camelopardalis. There was an English word, camelopard, which basically was what they used for giraffe because they thought it was a camel looking with with leopard spots. I don't think it looks a lot like a camel, but I guess it stands up and walks. So, so I have a question. So there are these four giraffe species. Are these all brand new? Is this all based on like these post four, yeah, research so, that came out recently with the... It is. They thought that they were subspecies of the same um, camelopardalis species, but now there is giraffa giraffa, which is a southern giraffe, giraffa Tipula scurchi. Oh, right? I like that. Maasai giraffe. Giraffa reticulata, which is a reticulated giraffe, and then uh, giraffa camelopardalis. And that one also, that still has some subspecies and things like that, but presumably they still interbreed, so who knows? Fascinating. So if you decide to become a giraffe breeder, you're you're all set now. I like it. You know, I think I'm going to I'm gonna focus on the tipple scurchi. Yeah, that's strain. probably the best one. Seems like the best <laughs> one. All right, well, let me give you the clue for next week, Josh. Each day, you should expect 50 to 70 billion of your cells to fall away due to this process. I'll read it one more time. Each day, you should expect 50 to 70 billion of your cells to fall away due to this process. Remember, I'm looking for a scientific word described by the clue, and once you get it, you'll find the literal meaning of that science word is a phrase in the clue itself. If you think you know the answer, email it to puzzle at hellophd.com. We'll randomly select a winner from all the correct responses and send the lucky puzzler an Amazon gift card. Fantastic, Dan. And speaking of Amazon, uh, we mentioned a couple of cool books you could check out. We mentioned the North Carolina Beer Brewing book by Eric Lars Meyer. We mentioned uh, Dr. Nutt's Drugs Without the Hot Air book. And then we also mentioned the one you're going to check out, Rory Vaden's Procrastinate on Purpose. Read about procrastinating. Or I'll just put off reading about procrastinating because I'll probably... Be oh, you drinking. can read about beer and ways to make beer exactly. more safe to consume. Uh, but I was going to say, Dan, if anybody wants to check these books out, you can click through our Amazon link and purchase these books or anything else. You'll pay the same price and we get a little kickback to help support the show. Super, Josh. Um, it was great talking to you. And now I feel like I need to go analyze my, my tasks for tomorrow. I'm going to do the same. Podcast. Eliminate. <laughs> oh, what Delegate. Hey, Josh, why don't you run the next one on your own? <laughs> Automate. Can I just uh, have a computer? That... Screen readers. We already learned about screeners. We'll just have it read Wikipedia for us. <laughs> All right. If you have an idea for a future show or you've got feedback for this show or others, you can email us, podcast at hellophd.com. You can send us a tweet. We love to read those at hellophd. If you want to help other people find the show, tell somebody in your lab, or you can leave us a review on iTunes. That really does help spread the word. Word. What is the word? Grease is the word. Hello, PhD is the word. We'll see you in a couple of weeks, Josh. See you then. <laughs>